Hello, I'm Terry Christensen, and this is Valley Politics. Today, Mike Wasserman, the president of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, will report on the state of the county. We'll ask him about the projected budget deficit and the future of Reed Hillview Airport, as well as where we are with the pandemic. And we'll have questions from constituents about equitable access to vaccinations, healthcare, homelessness, Laura's Law, and racism in county law enforcement. And that's what's coming up on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome President of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors, Mike Wasserman. Thank you, Terry. Mike, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, what's the state of the county? Let's hear it. I'm a cup is half full kind of guy. The state of the county is a positive one, a strong one. I am optimistic the worst is behind us. We are getting our vaccines out very rapidly. In fact, we're getting them out faster than the government can give us vaccines. We're currently set up to do about 100,000 vaccines a week. We're getting about 31,000. And if they give us more, we can get them out. And uh, 300,000 county residents, Terry, have already been vaccinated and our numbers are dropping down. I'm hoping to see red tier later next week. Everything is going well, knock on, not knock on wood. People are getting vaccinated and vaccines are the key to our recovery, our return to normalcy, our healing. Well, that's, that's great news. When do you think we will return to normality? Summer, fall? Well, different people describe normality in different ways. Our Dr. Cody, our yeah. public health officer, described um, having herd immunity, which is roughly 85% of all those people eligible to be vaccinated by August 1st. A week or so ago, she upped that to the beginning of, of summer. Um, again, if the state would give us the vaccines, we could vaccine, we and our partners, and by that I mean the county health system and Stanford and PAMF and Kaiser and El Camino, all working together and the pharmacies, CVS and Walgreens, all working together, we could easily vaccinate 100,000 people and a week. That's 400,000 people in a month. If we could get the vaccines, Terry, we could be back to normal in three months. Right, right. But that's a well, big as you, I understand. Yeah. As you know, Mike, we have several questions from county residents today. So here's the first one. It's from Myra Pelagio of Latinos United for a New America, or LUNA. President of the Board Wasserman, the Latinx community in San Jose and Gilroy have been the most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, not only by the rate of infection, but also economically, as many have lost their jobs. As Santa Clara County begins distributing the vaccine, we have seen the Latinx community has the lowest rates of vaccination. How can you, as president of the board, help the Latinx community in your district and in Santa Clara County as a whole recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? And also, how can we ensure an equitable distribution of the vaccine moving forward? Thank you. Thank you, Terry. My, my response to Mayra would be first and foremost, the state regulates what ages, what groups, teachers, 65 and above, public safety, et cetera. And we are getting them out there. That said, we know from all of our testing, and we're up to 25,000 tests a day, from all of our testing, we know the highest positivity rates are in East San Jose, in Morgan Hill, and in Gilroy. Double digits just a little while ago, we've now come into single digits because of the great increase we've seen thanks to vaccinations going on. But those three areas the county is targeting, they are being very specific about bringing the medicine, bringing the word, the outreach, to those areas which I just named, East San Jose, Gilroy, and Morgan Hill, with the highest rates of positivity. That's where we're bringing our pop-ups. That's where we're bringing our fixed. In fact, uh, I don't know what date you're showing this, but uh, just this morning, which was February 24th, oh, in fact, well, I've got a shirt under here that says Gilroy, Gilroy Rodeo. And this morning, I and the superintendent, uh, Deborah Flores, did the opening of our newest vaccination site, which is in at Gilroy High School, and people were lined up and already started. So we're bringing permanent sites, we're bringing temporary sites, 
to those areas where we know the most positivity rates occur. We need to reduce that positivity rate down, obviously to prevent people from getting ill, from, to prevent people from being hospitalized and perhaps dying. And people who are healthy can go back to work. So we recognize the impacts to the Latinx community in Santa Clara County, especially in those three areas. And we are aggressively increasing our efforts to bring the opportunity to be vaccinated to those areas. In addition, we have people going door to door. We have flyers, we have media going out in English and in Spanish, our outreach. We're using politicians, elected representatives with Hispanic background in each of those communities. We're doing media blasts in Spanish. We've dramatically increased our outreach to the Latinx community and it's working. Of course, two of those communities are in your district, Morgan Hill and Gilroy. Yes. And I represent a quarter of a million people in San Jose. Uh, yes, you do. Yep. Uh, so Mike, we have another health related question. This is from Nicole Huang. She's a Gunderson High School student. Here's Nicole. Hello, President Wasserman. How can the Santa Clara County create its own public health care system for the disadvantaged, similar to San Francisco's Healthy San Francisco program? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, what I'll say to Nicole, which is also my daughter's name, Santa Clara County already has such a health plan. It's called Valley Health Plan. And I'm sure if she Googles Valley Health Plan, she will like what she sees on that website. Well, that's great. Yeah. Heck, Nicole, San Francisco doesn't even have a football team anymore. <laughs> and we have San Jose State University. Joe Spartans. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, you also talked about the budget deficit in your state of the county speech. Why do we have a deficit and how bad is it? Sure. We've lowered our deficit budget prediction about six months ago, Terry. It was $350 million projected deficit. Now, so people can understand that number, we have an eight and a quarter billion dollar budget. But six months ago, we were predicting a $350 million deficit. Just recently, we lowered that number to 100 million. The reason we predicted 300 million before is we had so many people unemployed. We had so many businesses closed. And Santa Clara County's revenue, a lot of it comes from sales tax dollars, income tax dollars, property tax dollars, with businesses closed, shopping centers and commercial building values were going down. So we were seeing the property taxes, the assessed value of those commercial properties going down. So the property taxes generated from that reduced assessment would go down. People who don't have jobs don't buy as much. So they're not paying as much sales tax. People who don't have jobs aren't earning as much. So they're not paying as much income tax. We get two thirds of our budget from the federal and state government and they pay us off the receipts they receive from sales taxes and income taxes. We have now lowered our deficit reduction, like I said, from 350 million down to 100 million, which is great news because the vaccine is working, the economy is opening up more, home values did not go down. In fact, they rose a little bit. So that's encouraging news. But I wanna make all of your viewers realize Santa Clara County initiated a voluntary retirement pro program and a number of people took us up on, up on that. Santa Clara County also had hundreds of positions of vacant funded, vacant funded positions, meaning the money was in the budget, but there was nobody hired for that position. We did away with the vacant funded positions, that expense from our budget. People voluntarily retired and our revenue estimates increased. All those things considered, reduced our deficit, our budget deficit expectation for a deficit from 350 down to 100 million. And we have not laid off anyone. Hopefully, the trend will continue. More people will go back to work as they're getting vaccinated. They'll earn money, they'll spend money, they'll pay taxes, and we can get ourselves back to a zero deficit. And last but not least, the federal government seems to finally be working on a package that will reimburse counties for their COVID expenses. With all those things happening, we'll be back to zero. So actually it sounds like the glass is more than half full. Agreed. We are definitely, million dollars. We are definitely trending in the right direction. All things look good right now. Um, 
But of course, you could have another, I mean, God forbid, you know, COVID-21 could come along. So, but as things are going right now, people are getting vaccinated. Income, people are working, things are getting better every day. Well, $100 million is still a lot of money, although out of an $8 billion budget, it's just a little over one-tenth of a percent. Correct. Do you, do you think... Do you think cuts are likely to have to be made to adapt to that? Or are the other measures that you said the county's already taken, plus a little extra revenue, going to kind of get us through without slimming down very much? Sure. We just reduced to $100 million. Uh, we'll have another. We've got in May, we deal with our budget going forward. And I think that we're going to get to, I don't want to call it a balanced budget. We always have a balanced budget. But I, I think we're not going to have a deficit. Um, I also think that we are not going to need to lay people off. And if we do lay people off, of course, we'll be very, very, very judicious in making sure that the services that the county is expected to provide, we can still provide. You know, when the larger number was projected for the deficit, you said the county should stick to its core mission. Uh, what yeah. did you mean by that? What's the county's core mission? I guess the easiest way to answer that is what we call a safety net. The county, you know, there's the federal government, the state government, the county government, the city government. County government is the safety net for people. That means public health and public safety. The county has the second largest public health system in the state of California. Even though we're only the sixth largest county, we have prioritized, and by we, I mean myself, and my fellow supervisors that I work with, public health is the county's responsibility. It's what we do. We do it very, very well. Valley Medical Center has state-of-the-art physical therapy, burn center, all those things. We're, we're the emergency center for many counties around us. We do a great job providing public health, and we have continued to do a great job providing public health even over these last 12 months. Fortunately, we bought St. Louis and O'Connor Hospital a couple of years ago. We added many, many more beds to our public health system. But Terry, that also allowed us, if you recall when the number of ICU bed vacancies mm -hmm. got down, the state said if you got below 15% that we were putting you into purple, we actually got down to only 4% of ICU beds available in Santa Clara County, not just our public health system, but Stanford and Kaiser and El Camino and everybody all combined. We are now up, I believe, over 20%, perhaps 25%, because the vaccines are working, stopping people from having to, uh, to be hospitalized. But Santa Clara County's job, the county's job is public health and public safety. I just told you about public health. Public safety is county fire. Public safety is when people call 911 and they reach county comm. We have our jails, our public defender, our district attorney, all of those things. That's what the county of Santa Clara is responsible for, first and foremost. Sure, we also have a couple of airports, we have expressways, we have parks, we have libraries, all those things. But that's our priority, public health and public safety. And we have maintained the level that the county expects from us. That's a really good summary of what counties do. I think most people are really not very conscious that counties play such an important role in, in all of our lives, whether we need the safety net or not. Um, and our next question from the community actually deals with another set of issues you've been coping with. That's homelessness and mental health. Here's Jeffrey Hare. Jeffrey's an attorney and a downtown resident. Here's his question. Supervisor Wasserman, as you know, we have thousands of homeless in Santa Clara County, a significant percentage of whom suffer from severe mental illness. Aside from adopting Laura's law, what more can the county do to address this serious crisis? Thank you. Sure, we have done a lot and we're doing it very well. In our most recent board meeting, we had an update on our measure A. It was a couple of years ago, the county residents by a two thirds majority passed a measure A bond measure of a billion dollars. And that was to provide low income, very low income, extremely low income housing. And we are way ahead of our estimates on the thousands and thousands of such housing units that we're providing for the very low income. 
Terry, I'm a uh, little embarrassed to admit it, but back in the 1970s, I was old enough to work at Agnew State Hospital, which I did for a couple of years. And um, the state, I won't make fun of the state, but the state opted to close Agnew State Hospital. And as you and I and all your viewers know, mental health issues did not disappear. About five years ago, maybe eight years ago, time, last year is kind of like an invisible year, but it was about eight years ago. Um, I arrived at the county 10 years ago, but when I, about eight years ago, I talked about and reached out to people and asked about the homeless situation and learned that it cost less for the county to provide housing with services to our homeless individuals than it does to do nothing. And so back eight or nine years ago, my fellow supervisors on the board, we authorized the dollars and we started back then providing housing with services, mental health services, alcohol, drug services, getting a job, how to do a resume, how to Microsoft Word, services so that we could transition people from, become, from being homeless to being employed and self-sufficient. That has worked very well. The Measure A bond money has worked very well. And timing is good on this interview. A couple of days ago at our last board meeting, we brought up the idea about the county partnering into, the, into creating a regional, a regional mental health facility. Because people with mental health issues, they don't belong in jail. They belong in a facility where they can be taken care of by trained professionals. And that's very important and that's the direction the county is going in. There's a whole lot going on for our homeless people, a whole lot from the Measure A funds, providing housing, providing services, and it's growing and growing. And I believe we have something like 12 new developments that'll be opening in the next 12 months. Housing developments. Um, Mike, let me take you back one step. You said doing these things costs less than doing nothing. Yes. Why does doing nothing cost money? Excellent question, which a lot of people weren't aware of. But homeless individuals, they get sick. They're mentally ill. They do something they shouldn't. Periodically, they are picked up by police. Periodically, they are taken to a hospital. They're in jail. They uh, ambulance services, mm -hmm. all of those things. And what we didn't know when I got here 10 years ago, Terry, we didn't know the average cost to the county to, to care for homeless individuals. And so we did a one-year survey. We, we registered all the homeless people at the time. And when they were taken to the hospital by an ambulance, we logged that expense. When they were taken to the hospital, we logged that expense. When the police took them, we logged that expense. If they were in for X numbers of days, we logged that expense. And we learned then how much a homeless person costs just surviving, just being there. And then we added up, what would it cost to give them a place to, to live? A hotel, a motel, an apartment, transitional permanent to pay for services? That cost was about two thirds of doing nothing. And I remember saying at the time in an interview seven years ago, when somebody asked me, why are you doing this? I said, because it costs the County of Santa Clara less money to provide housing and services to our homeless individuals, many, many with mental health issues, than it does to do nothing. And it's the right thing to do. You know, Mike, you've heard this. A lot of my neighbors, I live in downtown San Jose, have been agitating for the county to adopt or opt into Laura's Law, which allows for court-assisted outpatient treatment. Uh, what's the county going to do about it? We're not in Laura's Law now. Uh, I think the county has to technically opt out in the next few months. Uh, what's the county going to do about Laura's Law? Laura, Laura's Law is interesting. Currently, our public health feels that everything that Laura's law would allow, we can already do through the court systems. And in talking with other counties, we, they hear about the, the benefits and the detriments of Laura's law. Some people are concerned that it'll be abused. Other people think it's the, it's the savior. 
but our health department points out that it's the court system that determines whether or not a person is to be housed. There's questions of you know voluntary versus mandated. There's all that going on. But I too just recently heard about the state. I, I guess, Terry, what they're gonna do is ask counties, are you in or are you out? Mm -hmm. And when that actually happens to us, then we will get research, um, best practices, research, actual data on, from counties that have Laura's Law and from the counties that don't. And then that decision will go to a committee, most likely health and hospital committee, because that's where it belongs. And then it'll come to the board to make that decision. But right now, any person that needs those types of services, if a judge agrees with that, that happens. Um, the county's also thinking about, or I guess you need to build a new county jail. Yes. But you also need mental health facilities. Yes. Can you do both? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, we have a place called Elmwood, yeah. a, main, a main jail north, which is, is right, right on heading, and a main jail south that we recently demolished. Main jail south was built in the 60s. It wasn't seismically sound, ADA sound. It, it wasn't healthy. It was, a, it was a horrible place. Main Jail North, I think, has only been open for about 30 years. And it's already not seismically up to standard, not ADA compatible, and not the most, <laughs> far from, the most conducive atmosphere in which to help recidivize, re rehabilitate individuals that need help. What we need is both, Terry. We need a jail and we need a mental health facility. I personally, speaking as one supervisor, I'm in favor of replacing Main Jail South that we demolished last month with a new jail that has mental health capacities inside the jail, professionals who can treat individuals who are both, who are dangerous to themselves and to others who need to be in such a facility. But then the many, many more that are not dangerous to themselves and others, that simply need mental health care. We need, and I, I mentioned in a previous question, we need a regional mental health facility would be a solution. A county mental health facility would be a solution. There's a number of different options and the board and our facilities and fleet department are looking into that. But it is not an either or. Mentally ill people that are not dangerous to themselves or others should not be in jail. And people that are violent criminals should not be in mental health facilities. So I, I believe we're gonna get a jail built and we're gonna get improve our mental health um, capacity in Santa Clara County, which is practically non-existent. Okay, thank you. So here's another question from a community member. This is from Samina Usman. Samina is with the Council on American Islamic Relations. Here's Samina. Hello, President Wasserman. Are sheriff's deputies and correctional officers adequately trained to prevent racist treatment of residents, both documented and undocumented, protesters and jail inmates? Thank you. The simple answer is yes. All deputies, former deputies and incoming deputies, all deputies are given, what do I have, uh, more than 50 more than 50 hours of training. It is mandatory, all of them. Deals with all types of training. Training about implicit bias, de-escalation, use of force, crisis intervention, and that's just to name a few. It's very intense and it's mandatory and it has been ongoing uh, for a while now. Okay, on a completely different subject, there seems to be a lot of interest in closing Reed Hillview Airport in the Evergreen District of San Jose, goal being to improve air, improve air quality there and provide land for much needed housing. What's your view of the future of Reed Hillview? Sure. When I got on the board 10 years ago, Terry, the, we had Palo Alto Airport, Reed Hillview Airport, and San Martin Airport. San Martin's the unincorporated community between the cities of Morgan Hill and Gilroy. And Reed Hillview Airport, Terry, operations are the word that they use for takeoffs and landings. Mm -hmm. Reed Hillview has more operations than San Jose International Airport does. Yeah. 
been there for a long time. The community has grown out towards it and people are bumping elbows and very concerned. You mentioned there's a whole lot of people that would like to see Reed Hillview closed. Believe me, there's a whole lot of people that wanna see Reed Hillview stay open as well. As for now, the, every time the county takes dollars from the federal government, that extends our lease with them about 20 years. There's currently 13 years left on that arrangement. So nothing is happening with the airport for at least the next 10 years. The concern that I've heard by the majority of people who were in favor of closing the airport were concerned about the lead emitted from the planes taking off. Because when you take off, you, you have to gun it to get up there. When they come in, there's very little emissions, but take off. At the end of our run runways, Terry, we have a meter that measures the lead in the air, and every single month those meter readings are sent in to the state of California's air quality, and we are below what's allowed. But still people say, and I totally understand this, people say, well, any lead is not good for you. It's better not to have any lead. So what I'm doing, and I've been doing it um, very intensely the last couple of months, and I'm looking forward to bringing the idea forward to the board, what I'm looking to do is bring lead-free gas to Reed Hillview Airport and San Martin Airport. In my discussion with the pilots and with the industry, I've learned that about two thirds of the pilots could transition over to lead-free gas if it was available. So right there, we could bring in lead-free gas and reduce the lead emissions by two thirds. Emissions which currently we're told are, blue, are below the allowed amounts. So that, that's how I see the situation. Okay, thank you. We have about a minute left, Mike. And you've mentioned that you've been on the board for 10 years. You have two years to go. Then what? What's your future in politics? At the end of 2022 will be my 20th year in politics, having been a mayor and a councilman and a county supervisor, all nonpartisan roles. My intention at the end of my current term, Terry, is I'm going to retire. God willing, my son will be able to get married this year. He, his wedding was postponed last year because of COVID and so many other people whose weddings were postponed. And I'm hoping a couple of years down the road to have some grandchildren. So grandpa will be 65 then, and I'm looking forward to taking care of new grandchildren. And I'm also looking forward to going back to a job I had 17 years ago when I was the eighth grade boys basketball coach at Fisher Middle School. So my plans are retire, coach youth sports, and be a grandparent. And I'm sure we'll see you continue to be involved with your, your community and with- Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm a Kiwani and I'm, I'm an auctioneer for the police department, absolutely. Community service is, is very, very important to me and my family. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, best wishes uh, in your retirement in two years. But thank you very much, Terry. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We'll be back next month with an update on philanthropy in the Valley with Nicole Taylor, CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Facebook, and you can also catch up on all of our previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. And now that's all folks. Thanks for watching.